everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Money Multiplier Podcast, where we ask ourselves, do your dollars make sense? I'm your host, Hannah Kessler, and today I'm joined here by a special guest, my dad, Brent Kessler. Hi, so, everybody. Hey, what's going on, Dad? <laughs> Good. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Now, Dad, I remember when we started this whole show, you were supposed to be here at the very forefront. You were supposed to be doing episodes with me. So where have you been at, man? Uh, well, you know, I mean, you're doing <laughs> such a great job. People want to hear from you and see your face. So um, I'm proud of you and what you've been doing and putting out all your episodes and giving people great content and great information. So the student has now become the teacher, <laughs> right? So that's what you are now. You are the teacher. Once the student and now the teacher. So that's pretty cool. I'm very proud. <laughs> Don't make me start crying already. <laughs> no, no, no. And I was just pulling your leg because I, I know um, when we first started this series, if y'all go back to the very onset of it, like in 2020, when this show did launch, uh, dad and I were doing a lot of shows and recordings together. But then, you know, we just traveled, just travel plans and getting nailed down time together. And dad already knows this. He's not the best with technology. So he's not going to be out there recording a podcast by himself. No way. <laughs> so, so anyways, no, but it's good to have you here. Um, and I thought it would be good to bring you on this episode today because the episode and topic that we're going to talk about is wealth building strategies for middle age folks. So I know just a few weeks ago, we went through um, wealth building strategies for millennials, Gen Zs, but hey, how do we take it now to the next generation, talk about the next group of people in line, maybe the baby boomers, if what you want to call them. So I thought it'd be good to bring you on here because you are in that uh, grouping of people and so I guess before we get into it, okay, so everybody, for you folks out there who aren't familiar with us over here at The Money Multiplier, um, Brent Kessler is the owner of The Money Multiplier. So so dad was really the one who, after his old mentor, he did pass away. And so then he went out and he um, then created The Money Multiplier entity. And so that's where we've been ever since after um, the old mentor past. So, um, so, so really, so, uh, you can go look up dad, uh, on the money multiplier.com or go out there and go, just go Google his name and you can see a whole bunch of his stuff. But if you guys have ever seen our presentation, you can hear dad's story about how our family got into this whole world of the infinite banking concept. So we're not going to get into it today on today's episode, but just for those folks that if this is new to you, so, I mean, do you want to tell the audience anything before we hop in? into it? Yeah, no, kind of like what you said. And of course, um, right before we started this episode, the thing that you were going to give me is some like topics to discuss. And I said, no, 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 Hannah, don't give me any topics. Let's just go with it. I like to talk just right, just basically straight from the gut, straight from the heart. So every question that you're going to ask or every topic you're going to talk about is, is this is going to be just the very first time I'm seeing it because I want to tell you just what my thoughts are. So I don't want it to be scripted. And, um, yeah, just kind of tell you the story and, you know, basically like straight from my heart of how I feel about this and how it's worked for us. And, um, so there's no fluff to any of this, as you know, Hannah, with our clients, you know, one thing that our clients sometimes or our potential clients, sometimes they think we're a little mean or rude or well, again, so like not you, but me maybe, because I just tell you like it is, you know, this is the concept. This is how it works. I don't try, you know, to tell you that it's great and it's not. I'll tell you the pitfalls. I'll tell you the good points. But this is what we eat, live, and breathe mm -hmm. every day of our life. So um, even though the information that we go over, a lot of you guys may not agree with it. You know, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. But again, it's just our life experiences. So that's what Hannah asked me to come on today and just share you know, topics and discussions. So I'm excited, you know, to do that. But I'm telling you guys, this whole thing, the infinite banking concept, it is, um, it, it will change your financial life. So even if you decide not just to do this, okay, um, maybe you decide not to do it like as far as, you know, on us, like just with us here at the Money Multiplier, you really, really need to go and dig deep into this and kind of research this concept mm -hmm. because it is a game changer in your life with your money and your finances. So, yeah. Good. 
Well, let's get into this. Let's bring it back all the way to square one. So what was your relationship with money like as a child and growing up? You, you know, what did you see your parents do <laughs> with money? And you can go in as deep into this as you yeah. want, or you can kind of scale it back. So are you going to show this to grandma and grandpa? And uh, grandma, <laughs> grandma and grandpa don't even know how to work a podcast or a phone, let yeah. alone. No, anyway, um, again, my parents, I come from a great family. They were very caring and giving and loving. And I don't think I could have come from a better family with love. But when it came time to finances and money, they sucked at it. It was horrible. You know, most people do. And I didn't really realize it at the time. So I always just kind of kid around. Well, and actually, it's not joking. I always say that my dad, he likes to buy high and sell low, right? So he just wasn't good with money. And if he made money, he spent money. You know, um, it, 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 I mean, it was just it was it was just not very good. But again, as far as my family, very caring, very loving, um, just not very smart with dollars and money and stuff like that. So um, so again, I kind of grew up in like an OK family as far as dollars and stuff goes and finances, but it was up and down. So my dad was a traveling salesman. Right. Um, I was actually pulled out of school in the 10th grade, you know, because, again, so my dad was a traveling. Um, he, again, he traveled around the country to sell, um, even traveled to other countries, you know, to sell. And he would do good for a while and make money, and then he would spend that money. And then he wouldn't do anything for a while and spend that money. And then it was time to make money again and spend the money and stuff like that. So um, it, it was kind of challenging. You know, I remember we lived, actually, at one time, we lived in the back of a vacuum cleaner store. It was in uh, Clearwater, Florida, and, you know, it was either... The thing we had to do was um, just have our house in the back of the vacuum cleaner store or choose to have an apartment. Well, the apartment's not going to pay any bills, right? So we had to live in the vacuum cleaner store. I remember showering at the YMCA. Um, and I remember, you know, um, not having a lot. You know, I had a friend and I remember his name was Gus and Gus was in a store down the street and Gus's family owned a Greek restaurant. Well, Gus was my good friend <laughs> because I could go to his just place and eat Greek food, right? So I, I got good food there, you know, with Gus when our family didn't have a lot for food or just, just a lot of money. So, but again, my family was very caring. They were loving, but not very good with dollars. And, and, and then, so anyway, just as a kid, you know, I had to kind of, just kind of carry my own weight, right? Um, I started out by just doing car washing. I was washing cars. I was like mowing yards. Um, I was doing odd jobs, even at, a, at, a, at just a very young age, before I could even drive. I remember my mom would pack my lawnmower up in the van, and we would take it, you know, um, like three or four miles down the road, and I would cut, you know, grass, like, like probably three or four houses and stuff, right? And then um, I got a job, you know, uh, as I was in school and I was just, anyway, there was another guy that had a lawn business and I was in his lawn business. And um, then I got into sales too. You know, I was selling as well, you know, um, a lot of the same things that my dad was selling. You know, he was selling vacuum cleaners. He was selling just these these treatment systems that you put on your house that like purifies all your water. So they're called water treatment systems or water uh, purification systems. So I went through a time and I sold those um, as well. So yeah. And the background, good. Then what, what was like the turning point? So then you got older, okay? So then you moved out, you got older. What happened when you moved out what was kind of that mind shift in or or who were the people or what were the tools that you learned from that point because remember you, you know it, it wasn't just the infinite banking concept you had your chiropractic days and then you had your save a lot days being the manager at save a lot right yeah, yeah. so so what was that turning point from the save a lot days to where you're at now like the people that you've met and the ideas that you have been taught. Yeah, well, I got a job as a bag boy at age 16 at Winn Dixie in uh, Pine Island, Florida, you know, so that was a job that I had and um, I kept that job for a while and then I went back in to, um, right, as far as just doing some like sales. Um, 
and I was going door to door, you know, I was doing door to door sales. Right. So, um, so it seems like you always had that drive I, though. I had the drive and that's the one thing that my dad really taught me was the drive and the persistency. And I never really took no for an answer. Well, again, I took no for an answer, but I was never concerned with no, where a lot of people, when somebody says no, they like freak out, you know, I'm like, no, is just going to be a step closer to the yes. So if I would go out and like sell and let's say nine out of 10 people said no, I, and so, so anyway, I knew I had to get to those nine no's to get to that one yes. Mm -hmm. So I just kept digging, digging and digging the ditch. And I figured if I dug through all the shit, there's got to be a pony down there somewhere, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So, but yeah, that kind of really helped me in that background. And then I was in the grocery business, a couple stints in the grocery business, Win Dixie. Then, like you said, I was working for Save a Lot. I went to corporate headquarters just with that grocery store. I moved from Florida to St. Louis, and I ended up going to chiropractic school. You know, um, I met my wife, and my wife had a good job. And I said, "Hey, honey, I, I'd really like to go to chiropractic school, but." You know, by the time I go through, because the first thing I had to do was get my GED, yeah. you know, and then I had to take all those undergrad classes and then I had to go to chiropractic school. And by the time I was going to get out, it was going to be like seven years. And um, that was back in like 1995, 1996, you know, so I was like 28, 29 years old at the time. And I said, well, honey, if I go to chiropractic school, by the time I get out, I'm going to be like around 35 years old in, in like six, seven, eight years or whatever it was. Yeah. And she said to me, she said, well, how old are you going to be in six, seven, eight years if you don't go to chiropractic school? Yeah. And totally made sense. So anyway, my wife really helped put me through chiropractic school and um, I did that. And of course, during that time, we had two uh, kids, you know, we, because that was like in the, in, right, in like 1995, 1996. And of course, you were born in 1999. Your mm -hmm. brother was born in 2001. So we had to balance the kids and the chiropractic school and all of that. So finally got through that. And um, that's when we opened up some chiropractic clinics and had those for a while. And um, I learned how to open up like additional clinics and have associate docs in those um, okay, in those chiropractic offices. So I did not have to be the one that would go in the clinic each and every day to practice, right? I own the clinics and manage the clinics. And then, um, of course, as you know the story, it was uh, 2006. I was at a chiropractic convention, mm -hmm. and I heard somebody talking about this thing called the infinite banking concept. And I was like, man, that's really, really cool, but it just seems too good to be true, right? And I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of you guys have heard things like that where you hear something and it sounds too good to be true. Um, well, that was me in 06. I heard about this concept. It's like really cool, but I didn't do anything with it. I left. I left that event in 2006 and did nothing. I even bought that book, Becoming Your Own Banker, brought it home, never read it, put it on the shelf. Then I go back to another chiropractic conference in 2008, and uh, about 10 or 12 of my colleagues are at that conference that were at the previous conference, and they were all just going on and on, and they were basically throwing up all over me. Brent, isn't that banking concept the most powerful thing ever to build wealth, pay off debt, expenses, recapture, recycle your money? So they were just throwing up all over me about it. So... Um, the only difference between them and me is back in 2006. So like when they first heard the information, they acted up on it where I didn't. So then in 2008, you know, I got 10 or 12 of my colleagues telling me about this. And I'm like, man, there's got to be something to this. There's no way that 10 or 12 of my colleagues are lying to me. Maybe one or two, but not 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. So I came home and that's when I told my wife. Um, who is your mom, um, <laughs> back in early 2008, I said, honey, I said, we got to start implementing this concept in our life. And it was at that time, February of 2008, where we found ourselves $984,711 in debt. That's what we owe to the third party creditors. And we were able to put this concept into place and we were able to pay off all of that debt in 39 months. Three years and three months, 
We didn't have to change our cash flow. We didn't have to work any harder, take any additional risk or lose control. We just added one step to our financial life. And that's the concept that now um, both you and I and several people on our team travel around the country and teach at live events or Zoom meetings, virtual meetings, podcasts mm-hmm. like this, right? Mm-hmm. So I became really passionate about this, yeah? So um, that was 2008, back when I started. Of course, I first heard about it, as I said, in 2006. Um, then in 2012, I started teaching this. So in yeah. March of 2012 is when I started teaching this to other people. And... Um, I, I was just telling people to do the same thing that I was doing with the policies, right? So everything that I even do now, anytime I talk to anybody, I talk to you about exactly the stuff that I was doing in my financial life and how I was able to take this concept, pay off the debt, pay off expenses, you know, pay down expenses, you know, all about keeping the money in your family, recycling and recapturing all of the money so there's no money going out to other people. And here we sit here and what is it? About the end of May of 2023. Mm-hmm. So I've been teaching this now for 11 years and three months. And you've been in this thing now for five years? Yeah. Something yeah. like that? Yeah. You know, so and... All we're doing is helping people. We're, we're helping people solve their financial problems. And it's not complicated. No. Most we're just people never think taught. it's way overcomplicated. They, mm-hmm. over they think there's got to be way, way more to it. It's not. It's really simple. I know a lot of you, when you watch our stuff, you're like, the questions that you ask, I'm like, why are you bringing up those questions? Where did you even hear that stuff from? Sometimes I think you guys just ask questions to hear yourself talk and you're thinking, oh, I don't have another question, so I better think of something. No, keep it super, super, super stupid, silly, simple. Mm -hmm. It's really, really simple. And just imitate and mimic what we do in our financial life. Because I'm going to design your policy the same way I design mine. I'm not going to put any secret sauce on my policy that I don't put on yours. Yeah. Now, the amount might be different. The premium mode might be different. But it's it's the same concept, it, the, right? The goal that we're trying to achieve is what? We're trying to turn every liability into an asset, every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset, and take control of our money. And there's still people that we go out to at events. We were just one in Fort Lauderdale last Saturday, and you know, and I was one on Tuesday night in Buffalo, and a guy sitting in the front row and said, Well, is this some kind of scheme or scam or something like that? And I'm like, dude, if you think it's a scheme or a scam, you didn't hear anything I said the last 90 minutes, and this probably is not for you. So you should probably just go do something else, you know? Because I don't want to care more about their financial life. I don't want to care more about your financial life than what you do. This concept, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is not brand new. I did not invent it. The guy that wrote the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, Nelson Nash, did not invent it. It's been around for over 200 years. Go research the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays. Go look and see how they built, kept, and created wealth. So the concept's not on trial. It's not being tested. It's not like, okay, let's see how this works. No, it's not about seeing how it works. You know, that would be like going out today in 2023 and saying, oh, I wonder if an airplane can fly. We know airplanes can fly, right? How long have they been flying for? It's not no longer a discussion. Can you get in an airplane and will it get off of the ground? It gets off of the ground, right? Nobody ever says, I wonder if the airplane is going to get off the ground. Let's go try it out and test it out. No, you don't even think about that. As a matter of fact, you guys don't even think about getting in an airplane. You just get in the airplane knowing nothing about the airplane, knowing nothing about how it operates. Or the pilots. You know nothing about the pilots. And when you get in the airplane, the pilots lock themselves up front. You can't even get in if you want to. You don't know if that pilot was out drinking last night. You don't know if they're having marriage problems or financial problems, if their wife is cheating on them or their husband's cheating. Whatever is going on, you have no idea what's going on in the head of that pilot, but yet you'll put your family on an airplane 
You'll get in there. Don't even think twice about it. The pilot locks the doors and you'll fly around the country or wherever you're going and don't even think about it about that. Yeah. But when it comes time to put $150 a month into a life insurance policy, it's all you guys, arms. it's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Why would I ever want to put money into a life insurance policy? Are you sure I'm not going to lose it? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just the craziest thing ever. Don't overthink this. Don't, don't, don't overthink it. Do not trip over the dollars to pick up the pennies mm -hmm. and don't let the nickel hide the dime. And that's what we do sometimes. We try to overcomplicate it. It doesn't need to be. Go study those people I just told you, the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, Morgan Stanley's, Barclays. Go out there and see how Walt Disney built Disneyland. How did Ray Kroc start McDonald's? How did how did Pampered Chef get started before Warren Buffett bought Pampered Chef? Learn the tools that the wealthy have been using for 200 plus years and use the tools that they're using. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're just going to do what they do. We're just going to practice what the wealthy do. The problem is... Hold on. Live podcast. Our dog walker is here. <laughs> the problem is, is that nobody's taught you this. And it's uncomfortable. It's outside of the box. It's not in our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's not whenever we're talking about money, you're not comfortable with this. And you know why you're not comfortable with it? Because this isn't what your parents taught you, your grandparents taught you. It's not what your friends, your colleagues, or your coworkers are doing. Quit following the masses of people. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see the masses doing something, maybe you should go do what they're not doing, and you're probably going to be right. Nobody, nobody in your state, whatever state you live in, has ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends that's specifically designed and specially engineered for high immediate cash value. It's never happened. Go look it up and try to find it. If you find it, text me, email me, and tell me what you found. Mm -hmm. What other, um, I wanna say, other concept or what other vehicle, what other vehicle is there on this planet that is a better place to store your wealth that has these features and benefits. Mm -hmm. I've been asking that question now for over 11 years. Show me another vehicle that allows you to do what this concept allows you to do that has these features and benefits. Mm -hmm. Nobody's been able to show it to me. Maybe if you have it, tell us what it is and maybe we'll stop teaching this and start teaching what you tell us. Nobody showed us that yet. Yeah. Actually, Dad, the community does know what a limerick is because they did share the story. <laughs> Where, remember in middle school, you'd drive Zach and I to school, and then um, there was two entrances of the school. And so Dad Dad would go around to the longer entrance, go over there, because there's not as many people over there, versus going to the one that's right in front of the school, because you'd be stuck there for like 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes <laughs> the long way around is really the shorter way, right? And that's exactly what it was. And then don't and fall then, the masses. And then I remember too. Do you remember when we lived in St. Louis? And and if you went to this town called St. Charles, okay. they had this bridge. Uh -huh. They had this bridge, and I don't know if you remember it. I Young. think Zach does. But anyway, there was this bridge, and the only way you could cross the bridge off of the highway is you had to get into the right lane. That was the only lane that would go over the bridge. So, um, and, and again, your mom got mad at me all the time for this. So why would I get in the right lane and follow all that traffic when I can get in the lane right next to the right lane and go up? And, and, then, and, and there's always somebody that will let you in. There's always somebody that has the personality that says, oh, I, I can't get too close to that car in front of me. Um, and if somebody comes, they're just going to let me in. So we get all the way up there to where you can't go any further. Or you got to, or you got to go straight. You can't get on the bridge, and you cut over, right? And I, and so I, you remember that? And now I understand why uh, Sean drives the way that he does. <laughs> <laughs> so don't follow the masses, right? You get up there and get your business done, and let's go. No, I'm telling you, in Pittsburgh, when, remember when I lived with Sean in Pittsburgh? That that was his driving style out there in the city. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, no, that's good. And actually, so one thing I just want to go back on 
So mm-hmm. we, we, we came through kind of the history of it. One thing that I just wanted to hone in on a little bit more too is because you were a very successful chiropractor before going out and selling the clinics and kind of doing something different. But one thing, and the community knows this as well, because I say it all the time, you know, it doesn't matter how much you make, it only matters how much you keep. Yeah. And so even as being a very successful chiropractor, you know, you you saw struggles in the clinic where you could be producing a million dollars a year, but if your overhead's 1.1, 1. 1, who cares how much you that you make? And so, so d- did Dr. Eric and finding those coaches really help you hunker oh, down? Absolutely. You know, and, and just kind of what you're referring to, you know, I, I used to coach chiropractors and, you know, um, everybody wanted the big practice, the big, big volume practice. And all that is good and everything, but just kind of think about what comes with that, you know, more stress, more responsibility, more people to manage. So I would always say, hey, look, if you had a choice of two scenarios, so like, would you rather make $1 million a year and have a $900,000 overhead, so your profit's hundred grand a year, or would you rather make $300,000 a year and have a profit uh, or just an overhead of $150,000 a year? Yeah. So then your take-home pay is $150,000, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if again, the, so the answer is obvious. You would rather, I, I would assume it's obvious, you would rather take home more. Because it's not about how much you make. It's about how much that you keep and that you take home to your family. And that's a powerful thing about the infinite banking concept is there's no money being leaked out. Yep. When you run your money through the policies and eventually what you want to do is every dollar that runs through your hands, you want to get them inside of the policy. Even Nelson Nash says that on page 48 mm-hmm. of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Mm-hmm. Premium and income should equal. Premium in income should equal because every payment you make is a deposit into somebody else's account. Mm-hmm. And who do you want that money's account going into, mm-hmm. right? The, Mine. the dollar you want it going into an account of yours that you own and control, right? So um, anyway, I'm getting off topic here a little bit, but your question was, you know, were there struggles? Well, yeah, you know, there's struggles. And, um, and I had a mentor. I had coaches. Mm-hmm. I had mentors that helped me. I say the three things that everybody needs, mm-hmm. um, and I just talked about this on a call that we did with uh, a, a brand new agent that's coming on our team. I just mentioned this. I said the three things, and I told him, I said, write down these three things. Yeah. I said, mindset, systems, and mentors. So it all starts with your mindset. Where is your mind at, and what are you thinking? You know, What is your objective or your goal or whatever? So you gotta have the mindset And if it's an outside-of-the-box mindset, better. You're better off being outside of the box, right? Your family is not going to agree with your mindset. If they do, you're probably doing something wrong because sometimes we have to fire the people around us just when it comes time to money and finances and specific mindset because they will drag your ass down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to fire your friends. Mm -hmm. I've even had this conversation with you. I said, Hannah, why are you hanging around, you know, this type of mindset with some people, you know? <laughs> Not that Billy Bob's a bad person or whatever. Go out and have a drink with Billy Bob, but when it comes time to your financial life, do you want something different than what Billy Bob has? So sometimes you got to fire your friends and sometimes you even have to fire your family. Yeah. Your family members will even bring it bring you down now i'm not saying not uh, okay so go to thanksgiving and christmas and easter and spend that time with your family and have a great time but when it comes time to your mindset and how you think about things you probably need to get on a different um arms length channel them arms length yeah you got to get on a different channel on just like where they're at because they're conformed to the normality oh well, I should be putting my money in a 401k, yep. an IRA, a qualified plan. Put I should be putting I should put it in the market. I should buy mutual funds. I, I should, should leave buy with a bonds. financial advisor. I should pay less tax now. I should save tax today. You know, I'm saving tax today. Mm-hmm. No, man, that's not what you want to do. You want to do totally the opposite. 
in my opinion, right? And, 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 and again, it's, it's just how we've been taught. It's how we've been. It, that's how we've been taught. That's how we've been programmed to do what our parents do, our friends, our colleagues, and our coworkers. So, mindset is number one. The other thing is systems. You have to have a system, and I think we have that with what we teach, which is the infinite banking concept. And all credit goes to R. Nelson Nash. Um, you know, without that book, Becoming Your Own Banker, without the mentorship of R. Nelson Nash, we would not be where we're at today, you know. And if 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 a, you guys have not bought that book, Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash, you better go on Amazon and get it or contact us and we'll... And, and the thing, you can get a copy from us. We're not here to sell you the book, but that's where the information comes from, mm -hmm. right? We want to give you the resources of where the information comes from. You need to have that book in your wealth building library. That is an, an essential book, Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash in your wealth building library. Um, so you have to have a system and a concept, uh, right? So mindset system. So the systems that we have is, and all that is dialed in. We have a complete team here at the money multiplier i mean we have we have like team members for every part of what we do in the implementation process of the system so it's not like when you come to us and you start a policy a banking policy we're like okay great we got the banking policy go get them tiger good luck to you yeah. no our work begins when you start your policy when that policy goes in force is when our work begins. See, most of the time, whoever you bought a policy from in the past, right, just a life insurance policy, the thing that stopped, um, okay, after you paid the premium, you never heard anything else from the agent. Think about it. Think about your life insurance policy. When's the last time your agent reached out to you and said, hey, let me help you with this policy? Yeah. Our work starts our work starts when the policy goes in force. Mm -hmm. And the thing you're doing is you're meeting with an implementation specialist two to three times a year, every four to six months. And we never charge you for that. That's all part of our servicing. And that's what sets us apart, in my opinion, at the Money Multiplier. Nobody offers the servicing that we do. Yeah. And you never pay for that. We don't charge you for that. We don't charge you a dime. Not one client has ever sent us a dime for anything whatsoever. That's all part of the service that we provide you. So we have that system that's dialed in. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that does it the way that we do. I, I just don't, you know, and I'm not saying that just to say it. I just haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. and, and even more, hardly anybody is out there teaching this. Yeah. Hardly anybody is actually teaching or if this they concept. are, it's in it's overcomplicating it in a way, in a manner that the public just doesn't understand, or they're talking way deep into the life insurance side of it. If I mean, if you ever see us teach live, you hear us hardly ever even mention the word life insurance, death benefit, right? Because life insurance is just the vehicle that we're using to store our wealth with inside of here. So I I I, I agree with you, Pops. I agree with you. On yeah, that one. and again that's that's exactly what you said, Hannah. That's the vehicle. Let's say if it was water bottles or glasses of water, right? And I say, hey, guys, the more of this you buy, these glasses of water, you're going to build, keep, and create wealth. Then I would be sitting here talking about water glasses. But it's not. The vehicle, the machine that we use to build, keep, and create our wealth is that whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends mm -hmm. that's specifically designed and specially engineered for high immediate cash value. Yeah. It's not the life insurance policy that you can go buy from your brother-in-law that sells life insurance, right? We, we all have a brother-in-law that sells life insurance. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. It's not that policy. right? This is the specifically designed, specially engineered whole life policy. So the third thing, we okay. said mindset systems, and the third thing is mentors. Mm -hmm. Find a mentor. Find someone that has what you want to have or that's accomplished what you want to accomplish, right? Look, here's what I tell people. Anybody that's going to give you financial suggestions or advice or recommendations, check them out and see what they're doing. Make them show you what they're doing in their financial life. I'm an open book on this. 
You guys can ask me anything you want about my financial life. And I'll tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'll tell you the stuff that I'm doing, the stuff that I did that I wouldn't do again. And I'm, again, I'm just going to give you my 55 years of experience. And um, I wish I would have known all the stuff that I know today at age 55 that you know at age 23. Yeah. Right? I mean, how cool would that be? I wish I could go back to 23 and have that knowledge. And I mean, and again, I know that just even with Hannah, she's learning every day, every day, every day. Don't eat the elephant all in one bite. You, or, 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 okay, so like all in like one bite, you eat the elephant one bite at a time, right? Mm -hmm. One bite at a time, not in the whole meal. So just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And Hannah's now been, you know, um, actively in, involved and ingrained in this stuff and for five years. Was that right? Five years since you were 18? 18, 18, or 19? Well, 18, well, 19? 17 is when I, when I started with y'all. Okay, so there you go. So, and you're 23. You'll be but you got to be 18 in order to own a policy. <laughs> well, but yeah, but that's okay. I own policies on you before, mm -hmm. and you own your policy. I still own policies on you, and you own your own policy. Yeah, when are you going to give them to me? So, uh, so anyway, what's our next topic? <laughs> Mindset, <laughs> systems, and mentors. You have to have a mentor. You got to have a coach, somebody that's going to walk you through the process and that's what we do we 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 have the all right well of course i can't i can't control your mindset but but here at the money multiplier we have the system we have the concept um and we've done very well with the concept and and the niche that we have and what we do and how we help people don't take our word for it look Go out there and follow all of the stuff we have out there on social media. You know, Hannah said, Google my name or go to the Money Multiplier. Watch the 70 plus videos. Go to the Chris Noggle stuff, the Devin Burr stuff, the Banking Bros stuff. I mean, look at all of that stuff and see in, in our success stories, our testimonies, our plan designs, our case studies. So it's not about... It's not about all the stuff that I say about us or what you say about the money multiplier. It's what other, other people say. say. People live vicariously through the words and actions of others. I can sit here and tell you all day long how great this is. Go look at those success stories and testimonials. But you have to have a mentor that's going to help you implement that system. And that's what we are. And I don't know if the right word is a mentor, um, but it's, it's a coach or somebody that's going to say, hey, maybe you don't want to do this or maybe you want to do this. Even when it comes time to premium. We just, anyway, there's many, many times where, so when you guys come to us, you say, I want to put all this premium in the policy. And we say, no, 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 no. You don't want to put all that premium in the policy now. And here's why. Now, look, I'm happier than a pig in a mud pile when you put premium in policy. Mm -hmm. The more premium you put in policy, I'm happier. Okay. But this is not about one policy and this is not about a short term relationship, right? Mm -hmm. This is a long term relationship. So whenever you tell us you want to do a certain amount of premium, and again, we never tell you how much to do, but we tell you way, way more often than not to lower the premium on your first policy. We just want you to get your feet wet, get you know, comfortable. Get, get comfortable with it. Don't look, the same thing would happen if you were going to learn to swim. Okay. The thing you don't want to Go out in the boat and be thrown in the ocean and you've never seen the water before. That would suck, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially you have no floaties on or anything and get thrown in the water, in, in the ocean. No, man, we just want you to put on the floaties and get in the baby pool first, mm -hmm. right? And kind of get a little comfortable with it and see how it works. But you do have to get in the game. You have to get in the pool if you want to learn how to swim. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of you out there that wants to go balls to the wall as fast as possible. And, and sometimes we got to hold you back like a, like a um, I don't know, what would you call it? Like basically like just like a raving stallion. Mm -hmm. We have to hold the, pull the reins back. And then there's sometimes some of you that like you're scared to dip your toe in the water. Mm -hmm. You're just like, you got to have every question possible answered. 
The, star ha the stars have to align with the moon. The sun has to align with the clouds before you can do anything. You are never, ever going to have every question that you have on your mind answered about this concept. I don't. And I eat, live, and breathe this every day, and I learn more stuff. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Can you tell me how every moving part works in your car? Right now, how does every moving part work in your automobile? You don't know unless you're a super hip-hop mechanic. 99% <laughs> of you have no clue how every moving part works in your car. You don't. Uh, uh, just a lot of you don't even know where the damn gas tank is, <laughs> right? So, or, or how to turn on the ignition on the car. Like, 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 where's the key? Oh, yeah, or try to pop the hood. Did you know in an Oldsmobile, what's that car, that Oldsmobile that I bought from Aunt Sandy's mother? Oh, the Buick. A Buick. Um, um, I don't know what what the heck is, is that? that? Well, it's an older car. I didn't even know they put car batteries underneath the back seat of a car. <laughs> you know how much time I spent looking for the car battery? <laughs> now, like Hannah said, I'm not real good on social media and stuff. So finally, I just called my son, Zach. I said, Zach, this is the craziest thing ever. This car doesn't have a battery. <laughs> and I said, this, I, don't believe, I don't know how it runs. It's like a 2002 or whatever it is. Yeah. It has no battery. And he says, Dad, what kind of car is it? I told him it's a Buick something. It's a Buick something. I bought it from... Um, I bought it from my sister-in-law's mother because she didn't doesn't drive anymore, and I just wanted it for a car to keep at the airport. When we fly into Fort Myers, I just wanted it as an airport car to get us from point A to point B. So I didn't want anything. I, it, it's just a car. It's a good car, low miles, but the damn thing didn't have a battery. <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding. What the heck's going on? So I, so I called Zach. And so Zach automatically, first thing, hang on, Dad, let me go look on YouTube or Google it or whatever. <laughs> and less than... Two minutes later, probably 30 seconds later, he says, Dad, go out there and pull up the back seat. So I pulled up the back seat, and sure enough, the battery is in the back seat. Uh -huh. That would have been the last place I would have looked was the back seat. Uh -huh. So, in other words, you guys don't know how your car operates, but you'll get in your car, you'll put your family in it, and you'll drive it all across town, across the country, wherever you're going, and you don't even think twice about it. You don't even think twice about the safety. But you want to know every single answer about how this whole life policy works. No, you don't need to know everything. You'll learn as time goes on. If you're the type of person that has to have every single question answered, then call me up and I'm going to refer you to some other people that practice the banking concept. It won't be with us, right? You will not be a good fit with us. It will not work. We will drive each other nuts and you and me will feel like we need a shower at the end of every conversation. It won't be fun. So you do not have to know how everything works. I'm just telling you. And, I, and again, I hope you take that in life and just not with this concept. It's okay. You you learn as you go. Yep. Right? It, it, and I'll tell you that right now there's agents on our team. And I'm like, um, I'm, I'm not going to mention the name. There's like two of them that come to my mind right now. Um, and I'm afraid to mention the name because we might have an agent with that name. But I'm like, um, um, whoever it is, let's call it. Um, Sylvester. Pinocchio. We don't Pinocchio. have a Pinocchio on our team. <laughs> Pinocchio. Listen. You're driving yourself crazy, you're driving your clients crazy, and you're driving us crazy because you have to know every single answer. You think you have to know every answer when your client calls. No, you don't. It's okay. If a client asks you a question and you don't know it, great question. I don't know. Let me find out and I'll get back with you. Mm -hmm. It's okay. We can find the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Just like today, there was a call that we had. And, you know, there were some questions on there from an agent. And I said to him, I'm not going to mention his name. We'll call him Pinocchio, Sylvester. So, hey, look, you don't need to know that. And if you bring it up to your clients, your clients are going to want to know that. They're going to start thinking about it. No, you don't need to know that information. It, it, it doesn't affect what we're doing with the policy. So, mm -hmm. anyway, um, yeah, so just don't think you have to know how everything in your life works. It, it, before you start it you know um sometimes you just have to get in the game and then as you go you'll figure it out yeah just know this okay like i said earlier nobody 
on this planet has ever lost money in that whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. So why would you be the first? Why would I design your policy differently than mine? I'm not. I'll show you my policy design. So if I'm going to design a policy and I'm going to buy one or two of these every year, or I'm sorry, one policy every one to two years, why would I design it the way, okay, so just in that way, if it wasn't the best thing to do, mm -hmm. right? I mean, why would I do that? Why would I not design it the best possible way to do it to, in order to able to take this concept and maximize it to the top level? Just like when Hannah gets a policy, you know? I mean, right? So before it, like every time Hannah would get a new policy, she'd say, Dad, what should we do here in the design? I say, Hannah, let's just design it like the rest of them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what we're doing. I mean, the policy that you design for yourself, you're designing it to maximize the banking concept. Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. It's that's, not rocket science. The special juju or sauce that we're doing. And just know that it's not about instant gratification all the time. A lot of you guys think, oh my gosh, I want to put a dollar into the policy and I want to have 98 cents available right away. It's not going to happen in a properly designed policy. It's not. It's not. You're going to pay the price later. Well, that's policy design, so we won't get into that. I got, I got a video another, coming that's out. That's for another yeah. topic. Yeah. Well, okay, so, so I know we're kind of getting here, and I don't want to go too long on this episode. Later on, I want to come back and ask you a few more questions okay. about, like, um, you know, because mom came from corporate, would you call it corporate America? Yeah, yeah. Mom, yeah. Anyway, mom is her degree is in engineering. She has a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Mm -hmm. She worked for the, just the government. She designed the nuclear reactors for the Navy sub. So she kind of had a government job. So she was more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Conformed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. More structured or more conformed. You know. Um, yeah, and and. and, and and it's okay. That's the way that you were taught. And so we just have to change some of those habits, maybe. Or maybe not. Yeah. You know, we just have to see. And that's what we do just when we have a strategy call with you. We see where you're at, what's going on, and what your goals or objectives are. Our job is to solve your financial problem. Mm -hmm. Our job is to give you the solution for your financial problems. Or to make your financial life better if you have no financial problems that's yeah. our job and if we don't provide that service then you should not work with us if we don't give you good strategies or good um, tools to use then there's no service we're providing you mm -hmm. now you remember so so let, let's end it off here you know how we were in dallas at the chiropractic event mm -hmm. and there's a gentleman up there he was speaking ed Milet. And he's up there talking. Yeah. And, you know, he said something along the lines of how, you know, you don't have to listen to me, but I got over, what did he say, like 300 or 30 million net worth or something like that? Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you, what are you doing right now with your stuff, your policies, and your investments that you're doing? And, and, and are there things that the community can take away from things that you're doing because... I mean, I mean, folks know that you're successful in what you do. I mean, who in the hell needs three airplanes? I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> One's but, for sale. <laughs> but, 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 what, um, what would you tell the community that has really been helping you? I know you're doing policies, and please tell them how many policies that you own that you're using. But, but, what has really been helping you through the policies of putting that money to work for you? Yeah. So, um, yeah, and and again, so. Um, anyway, the thing that like Hannah's referring to is we were at a conference in Dallas and it was a group of chiropractors, great conference, by the way, at the Gaylord in Dallas. If you mm -hmm. haven't been there, that's a cool place, man. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Ed Milet was one of the speakers and some of you guys might know Ed Milet. And, um, as he was speaking, I guess he saw people in the audience that weren't paying attention or texting. And he said, Hey, he says, look, man, I don't care if you listen to me or not. And I see a lot of you, you know, talking or zoned out or texting he says, but I'm up here, and if there's a guy on stage and he's worth like, and he's worth like seven hundred million dollars, you should maybe stop texting and start listening. Yeah. Because I'm only up here an hour. 
And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, <laughs> I mean, it made him stop and it made him listen, right? And yeah. it's the truth. You know, so the thing you want to do is gravitate and listen to people that have been successful in their life and what they're doing. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm always happy to share my net worth with, with you and share with you what I'm doing. And I currently have 25 of these policies. Buy a policy once every one to two years. I'll never stop buying policies. They'll, I mean, until the day they're throwing dirt on me and when they're throwing dirt on my head, I'll be hollering up, hey, get another policy, you know, <laughs> as the dirt's being thrown on my head How after I die, pass, or graduate. Around $700,000 in premium. So remember, the policy is not the investment. The policy is the process of what we're going to do to make the investment. So me personally, I want all as much money as I can get into a policy first. Now, the problem is with getting like more and more money into the policy, there comes a point where you have a hard time getting more. You have to start insuring other individuals because you can't overinsure a body the same way you can't overinsure a car or a house, mm -hmm. right? So I put money in the policy and then from the policy, I will go out and make my investments. Now, I don't want you guys to change anything you're doing with your money. I don't want you to change your cash flow, work any harder, take any additional risk or lose control. But the thing that I do is I like to invest in things that um, are safe, you know, that very minimal risk. Any investment is a risk. The policy, a lot of people think the policy is an investment because it goes up in value. It's guaranteed to go up in value. Yeah. It can never go down. It's in your contract. Before you sign, accept, and pay for the policy, if it doesn't say in that contract that policy continuously goes up in value no matter what happens, then do not sign the contract. Yeah. So it's guaranteed. So an investment can go down and up. The policy can never go down. So the policy is not an investment. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is I like to invest in things like real estate. I like to be in first position in real estate investing. Never second position. If I'm not first, I'm last, right? Yeah. And then I like to do lending. I like to lend with good collateral. And most of the time, that collateral is real estate. If you ever want to know specifically the type of real estate that I'm in, um, which that's not my favorite thing to do. My favorite thing to do is lending because then I have less headaches. I know what's coming in every single month. I know if, if I loan you X amount of dollars, you pay me X amount of interest. That money comes in every month or every quarter, however, however it's structured and set up. And I know that money is coming in. And, and if the money doesn't come in, if you stop making the payments, I'm in first position of the equity of whatever that equity might be. In this case, it might be real estate. So if you don't pay, then I will come after you and foreclose on that equity the same way a bank would foreclose if you didn't pay your bank mortgage. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So the risk is minimal because you don't want to give up the equity that you've already built in that thing that I loaned you the money for, mm -hmm. right? So because it's going to be painful for you to quit because you're going to lose at the end of the day because there's already enough collateral or equity before I even loan you the money anyway. And there's deals out like that all over the place. If you want to know who I personally work with and I'll turn you on, you know, to uh, people in my network of who I loan to and why I loan to them, I'll even give you the amounts of money that I have loaned out to them. Mm -hmm. I'll give you all of that information if you want to do um, a call or talk about it. Good, good. And really, I mean, that wraps it up for this episode. You know, I really just wanted to bring to the forefront of the conversation of wealth building tools for middle age people. But if you notice from the past episode, the one that I did with Robert Lee uh, from, from the Cash Compound, the topics that we talked about on this podcast episode, were they really different from any of the topics that we talked about on the last one? Not a whole lot, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how old you are, how early in the game, how late in the game that you are, all of these strategies can work for you. It's like the same uh, topic when I talked about, hey, what would Hannah do if she made 50,000 a year? Remember, I just used a 50,000 a year income as my number, but I could apply the same rules if I made 250,000 a year income, right? 
So I think that's just the biggest thing that I really want to hone in and break down on the misconceptions of money is, is that money is not hard to understand. We're just never taught it or we're improperly uh, taught it. (laughs) <laughs> so, so all right. Well, thank you for joining us on today's episode. And uh, please give us feedback. Give this show five stars. Subscribe to the YouTube page. Go give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, the TikTok. And um, Dad is out there as well. Go look him up, The Money Multiplier or Brent Kessler. And uh, we'll have him on uh, here soon for another episode as well. So thanks, Dad. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.